I'm a little sad right now. I want to be happy. Yeah. Sad. Don't don't even ask him, Travis. What do you? All right. Uh, go ahead, ask him. I know what he's gonna say. Uh, why are you so sad? <laughs> I I need I need ratings. Oh, here it comes. I, I, got, I gotta have ratings. So you would stop crying if people gave you more ratings? I would feel so much better if people gave us ratings, you know. Wow, that's a very quick turnaround. That was quick. That was pretty fast. Rate and review. Rate and re- really, really rate and review. Makes me happy. Give the show five stars. And five. That's yeah. five. Not four. Yep. Not six. No, and, just five. Five's good. <laughs> I like and, five. And I'm... In all seriousness, it really helps people find the show, and we love to see your feedback. Small town girl Bonnie Lee Bakley always dreamed of marrying a movie star. Her obsession with celebrities resulted in nine divorces, until Bonnie eventually married famous actor Robert Blake. However, Bonnie learned being close to the spotlight comes with consequences. Within a year of her marriage, her Hollywood dream came to a tragic end when she was found fatally shot outside of a diner in North Hollywood. From Wondery, The Execution of Bonnie Lee Bakley is a thrilling new chapter in the hit Hollywood and crime podcast series. Robert Blake knew Bonnie spent most of her life as a con artist who dreamed of being famous. But when Robert Blake reluctantly let Bonnie stay in his guest house, it began the role he'd become most famous for, an accused murderer. Explore the darker side of fame. Listen to The Execution of Bonnie Lee Bakley on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Hello! Oh, whoa! Whoa! Wow. Whoa. Wow. Wow. Just wow. Let me do... Let me... I'm going to try and calm this down. Travis. Yeah. What's up? Not much. Excellent. What, what's going on with Adam, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. Caffeine, oh. maybe? Throw no, some no. beer in with my wine. I think he's practicing for his new show that I'm trying to talk him into, which is Jews Read the News. <laughs> Hello. No, it's not. No, it's Jews Sing the News. Oh, I'm such a dope. Go ahead. Sing the news. What happened yes. today, Adam? Another day of inflation. It seems like gas will soon have to ration. <laughs> it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> Things are not going well with the nation. That does rhyme. I think it's time for another libation. Wow. Mm. Nicely done, Adam. Um, so what did happen this week, week <laughs> besides Adam clearly losing his mind? Someone stole my recycling bin. That was a weird one. What? Yeah. No. Yeah. Scandal. Did they just have a cooler new one and you made yours disappear? I have absolutely no idea. They were really noisy about it. So yeah. No, no, no. I meant like, was it a scam on your part? You know how like sometimes they do a reissue and then like people who move to your neighborhood who are new, they get the nice new recycle containers and, and you still are stuck with your crappy old one? No, I hadn't thought about that actually. Hmm. So this was legit got stolen. Yeah. Where'd it go? I have absolutely no idea. If it was stolen, how would he know where it went? Hey, you can find these things. (laughs) Did you put signs up? Did you say, have you seen this recycled? (laughs) (laughs) Wait, are you the guy putting up the pictures all over the telephone poles asking people if they saw a recycling unit? (laughs) Have you seen this used matchbook? I put up all kinds of signs. Have you seen my napkins? (laughs) Speaking of recycling, um, we got any good password-related stories this week? Um, they found 24 billion uh, credentials being uh, usernames and passwords on the dark web. That's Dr. Evil, pinky to the lips. I knew you were going the there. Billion <laughs> but, passwords. But oh, billion. I thought you were giving a list of who found them, like Minion A, Minion B, Adam, Adam's buddy from, from, you don't play golf, so I don't know where your buddy's from, from the gym. Adam's big on the gym these days. Yeah, I'm big on them. I, I, I pass by them. I think about them often. <laughs> I occasionally show up. So my gym, every time you walk in, they have a new question. My son and I try to figure out the question. Most of the time we get it wrong, but you know, every so often we get it right. Like, here's one for you. What's the fastest muscle in your body? 
the fastest muscle mm. in your body. Um, uh, I'm not sure, but I, if I had to guess, I'd say the heart. No. No. Mm. Um, I'm gonna say the uh, I eyelid muscle. Close. It's the eye. That's mm. not a muscle. Well, that's the question, and that was the answer. Damn. Weren't we talking about passwords? We were. We were talking about... But, you know, if you think about it... I have it, to say, this is the first time that our producer, Andrew Steven, has had to break the wall of his studio in order to get us back on course. We're clearly suffering from some sort of almost midsummer cuckoo bean uh, illness. Let's get on Let's get on target here, on focus. Let's get... Wait, I wait, can't wait, let's, think. Wait, wait, let's, roll, let's roll the tape back. Cuckoo bean... I was wondering about that one. Cuckoo bean. What's wrong with cuckoo bean? What is a cuckoo bean? It's your head, man. A bean is a head and cuckoo is what you are. Cuckoo bean. I take offense at that. <laughs> That's not even a word. <laughs> I take you as reference for that. <laughs> so can you so can you imagine 24 hmm. billion Billion. Exposed passwords. There's billion. not 24. But wait a second. There's not 24 billion people on the planet. That's correct. But you have lots of people who use multiple really stupid passwords. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, like, ha, 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 ha. Or one, two, three, four, five, six. Or just password. A password that a lot of children use because they have not been, like their parents, they have not the slightest inkling as to how dangerous a bad password can be. Uh, so the password will just be, you know, f six zeros in a row. It's definitely not that people haven't been told repeatedly not to use weak passwords. Because the attitude is, it'll never happen to me, so whatever password I wish to use, like, you know, hello. <laughs> They're talking about we're going to a password-less future. Yeah, the I moment, think it's a good move. In the moment, we're at a mindless present when it comes to passwords. A hundred percent. I'm still skeptical that we're ever going to fully do away with the password. People have been saying that we're uh, heading to a passwordless future for decades at this point, and it's still sticking around. So. Okay, so what would it look like? Let's talk about that for a moment. Do you have, I, I know that Apple and Google and several entities have said they would like to move in that direction. How would it, how would it work? Uh, one of the big ones that they want to use is for facial recognition. I just already, I already use it. That's really going to be useful while COVID's bopping around. Except when Bo finally shaves his beard, then it will say, who are you? No, actually, you know, originally identity, and this is a good, this is really a good little piece of information. I forget what the system was called, but it was the first kind of identity um, that was that that was used in a widespread way was based on body measurements. And there were certain measurements like the, yes. the, the, the length from your hand to your shoulder and around your head, a few other measurements that they used on prisoners to identify them because you couldn't fake it. You, you couldn't fake those particular measurements. And the same goes for facial recognition now. So my beard doesn't matter so long as my eyes stay relatively in the same place and my nose <laughs> stays <laughs> in the same place. It can still recognize me even with a beard on. So, so you, Adam, you're not going to, when you get those funny uh, glasses with the big nose and the mustache, they can still tell who you are. Well, actually, what I'm most excited about is you remembered what we wrote in our book. It's true. That was from, that is something that we wrote. So it is sort of engraved in my head. You can find out more in Swiped, uh, which has a password I can never remember. The book? Yeah, the book that I co-wrote with you. I don't remember the password ever. We had a password for the book we wrote? Did I say password? Yeah. You did. I need to go to bed. I meant <laughs> <laughs> subtitle. I meant sub. I meant subtitle. How to, how to protect yourself in a world full of scammers, fishers, and identity thieves. All right, Travis, what's the subtitle of the book? How to protect yourself in a world of scammers, fishers, and identity thieves. No, a world yeah. full of scammers. Well, see, right. I can yep. never remember it either. I, I mean, for years now, and I cannot remember it. 
That's okay. One site was explaining. It said, how to protect yourself in a world full of fishers, scammers, and identity thieves. And someone said, you don't even remember the subtitle to your own book? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to What the Hack, a show about hackers, scammers, and the people they go after. I'm Adam, Cyber Scam Samurai. I'm Bo, Cyber Dustpan. And I'm Travis, Cyber Geisha. I feel like the object that doesn't match. <laughs> yeah, and I heard Samurai. I was assuming you're going to go for Ninja or something. No, just just Dustpan. <laughs> and today we hear how COVID, unemployment, and a Brad Pitt movie changed the life of Abby Sturgis. Private chance. Five star restaurants. Expensive champagne. How could they afford the luxury lifestyle? In today's world, the power of influence can be the quickest path to money and fame. But what happens when it's built on lies? Indeed. From Wondery, Scamfluencers is a new weekly podcast series that tells unbelievable true stories behind some of the world's most infamous scammers. Scamfluencers unpacks extravagant accounts of deception with co-hosts Sarah Hagee and Sachi Cool, who discover what drove these scammers to deceive others, why so many believe them, and how our culture allows them to thrive. Each season of Scamfluencers will immerse you in the shocking tale of a fraudster, their victims, and what happens when the facade comes crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. So today we want to welcome to the show Abby Sturgis, who is dating my nephew, terrific woman, um, a New Yorker originally, and then her life took an interesting turn based on a movie. Well, I was uh, born in upstate New York, and uh, my dad actually saw the movie A River Runs Through It. Now, hold on. There's lots of rivers that run through upstate New York. Where in upstate New York were you from? Well, so I'm, um, I'm originally, I was born in Albany, um, okay. but my A my river family, definitely runs through that. <laughs> <laughs> but my, uh, my family's in uh, Johnstown and Gloversville, too. So, oh, nice. Um, yeah. So he, uh, he saw the movie A River Runs Through It, which yeah. was filmed in Montana and, uh, impro you know, um, prompted the move for us because he's a big uh, hunter fisherman. And yeah, we made the trek across the country and uh, moved to Montana when I was about two years old. So um, I've been there uh, most of my most of my life and have been now in L.A. for about six years. How did he pitch the move? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was a little young to remember. <laughs> right. She was two, Travis. She was oh, two. I, I'm just, I'm just sort of imagining right, coming you know. home from a movie and just being like, guess what? We're moving. <laughs> Especially right, when so. there's like hunting and fishing around Albany. There's plenty of hunting and fishing Plus, he, around there. He was throwing yeah. you a line, clearly. <laughs> Yes. Well, well, yeah. I mean, the fi the fly fishing was really what got him on the hook, I should say. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, all the fly fishing in Montana is a huge deal out there, and yeah, just the peace and quiet. And well, I'm, I'm waiting for baited with bated breath to find out more about <laughs> your Montana experience, especially for those of us who are fans of the TV series Yellowstone. Montana has oh. become very near and dear to our hearts. Oh, well, Montana is a beautiful place. I mean, that's, I thoroughly enjoyed my time living there. I'm so lucky to have grown up in such a amazing place that, I mean, has everything outdoors from, you know, hiking, I mean, water sports, uh, skiing, the skiing is phenomenal. Um, I actually like, you know, most of my jobs growing up were more outdoors. I worked, you know, on um, Whitefish Mountain Resorts. I did summers at the Aerial Adventure Park. I taught ski instructions, um, you know, every seasonally. So, 
grew up with a very um, outdoorsy lifestyle that was it was really nice place to live. So you worked in Whitefish. So you must be near uh, the Flathead Reservation and and uh, out there in, in the northwest. Where do you where are you where are you from? Yeah, so um, northern Montana. It's called Kalispell. Oh, Kalispell, um, yeah, right yeah, near. Yeah, we're about a yeah, right near Whitefish. Fifteen minute drive. Uh, you know, we're about thirty minutes from Glacier National Park, hour from the Canadian border. So it's very beautiful. Lots of um, you know mountains, lakes, rivers, all of it. So it's definitely a beautiful place to grow up. I'm very grateful. What brought you to LA? Well, I, you know, growing up um, in such a small town, uh, you know, very secluded area, there's more cows than there are people in Montana. So I definitely, a lot of people, um, you know, once they graduate high school, want to get out of Dodge and go experience the world. And for me, I started in Denver, loved it, but it, you know, the market and everything got so crazy. I was like, why not live by the coast? So California had always been, you know, something at the top of my mind and, great career wise. I was doing um, eyelash extensions at the time. So I made the move and, you know, was fortunate enough to work at some amazing salons here and take some incredible VIP clientele. So that was, you know, the, the absolute goal. And it was great to accomplish that. And now I've transitioned into real estate. What made you get out of the out of the business and get into real estate? So there are a lot of um physical, physical issues that can come with working such a, you know, physically demanding job. So Uh you're, you're doing very tedious motions, uh, for long hours of the day, Uh um, very repetitive, um, kind of detail work. Typically what you'll see in lash artists, the most common kind of physical ailment is going to be carpal tunnel. Before the pandemic hit, I was having to uh, reduce the amount that I worked. And so when the pandemic happened, I definitely took advantage of that, you know, break on my body and kind of exploring what else, what other industries I could be interested in that wouldn't maybe um, affect my body quite as much. (laughs) When the pandemic started, you were making a transition or already thinking about it. Um, And I imagine it's pretty hard to do eyelash extensions uh, during a pandemic that is transmitted from person to person contact. What did you do? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, here in LA, they, uh, the salons were definitely one of the first things uh, closed down because of the close contact that we come in on a daily basis with our clients. So um, it affected our my industry specifically very quickly and um, abruptly, absolutely. So um, I was out of work. I then transitioned um, into receiving unemployment assistant from with the pandemic. So. So now in the state of California, how does the unemployment system work? So as a recipient, how does that, how do you get the money? So here in California, they have a portal where we would, um, where we would claim our benefits weekly and have to, you know, place in all the info on whether we received any income, et cetera, um, and do weekly benefits online and then uh, we received a card through Bank of America that would have those funds transferred through the portal. Is it a credit card or a debit card? So it is a debit card. We had a PIN number, um, but it did not have a microchip. It only had the swipe. Why is, why is that? Why is that? I was really interested by that as well. I do, do not know. You, know you don't know why. Um, Adam, you have any thoughts on that? Because the chip is more secure. No, the chip is definitely more secure. But a lot of states, even though they are trying to get more technologically advanced, haven't quite made the complete leap to chip and pin. Interesting. Yeah, I was definitely surprised by the lack of chip on our I know, our Abby, system. I am too. It I'm definitely totally... would have come in handy. <laughs> And how easy was it to actually start receiving the funds? Um, If I remember correctly, I believe it took a while to get it initially Mm -hmm. approved. Um, I want to say like around a month of waiting. Um, And then, you know, along throughout the process, typically, 
there would be, um, you know, I would get it regularly. There wouldn't be too much delay, but every once in a while, I think it was had to do with the overwhelming amount of applicants for EDD and like the, you know, whatever money that they had designated for it. By the way, EDD stands for the Economic Development Department of the state of California. It slowly started to have issues with people. Like it would tell me, oh, claims have been approved for this week, but then I wouldn't get the money in my account. So, you know, little things like that would happen and you'd have to call or email and try to figure out, you know, where are these funds? Hey, what's going on? So little things like that definitely happened. And usually you could get some sort of contact and resolution around like two weeks if there was an issue with that. But um, but it, it required a lot of holding time, didn't it? It kind did. of like your life is passing in front of you. Yeah. Yes. And it definitely, you know, throughout, as time progressed, it got harder and harder and more issues started started coming up and, you know, it would take longer delays and then people aren't responding to your emails and questions. So it, it definitely started um, a downward spiral with their system and um, communication with it. So. Is that something like, was the unemployment system sort of broken to begin with or was it just having that many people with... Uh losing their jobs due to COVID? So I personally, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I do, you know, I wasn't, I was, I wasn't on unemployment before the pandemic, but mm -hmm. from what I read and understood of when this was happening specifically in California, I do think it was a lot of issue with the way that they, um, uh, disperse the money and the fraud. From what I mm -hmm. understand, there was, you know, like a ton of fraud cases happening on a larger scale and they kind of like took that and punished every little, you know, all the little account holders and everything right. and made it, you know, it became everybody's problem that there were huge fraud accounts happening. When you called in, were they responsive to you? No, you would be on hold for days, if not, you know, I mean, it. Did you even, could you get through to the, I mean, you know, those systems where sometimes they just hang up on you. This Absolutely. So <laughs> like I said, you know, in the beginning, they were better about responding, at least via email, you could get some sort of like communication and on the EDD portal itself. But when you tried calling, I mean, it just progressively got to the point of absolutely they would hang up. You can, you know, no matter how many times, no matter what time you called, no matter, you know, how long you were on hold, it could just hang up at random or it would do it right away. You couldn't even be on hold. It was so long of that, especially when I had my fraudulent thing happen. It was at its worst. Absolutely. <laughs> and when I, uh, you know, I recall when I was, uh, this was happening and I was researching it, uh, there, the only way people could find out anything was just by other recipients talking to each other on Twitter and social media. That's, that's the only way I knew I, I had to go on social media to see if anybody else was going through what I was, because I was just getting apps. I mean, so many people, thousands and thousands of people in the exact same situation. I've claimed my benefits. I haven't gotten anything. They won't answer the phone. It's been four plus weeks. I have rent to pay. Nobody's answering. Nobody's getting back. It was, I mean, constant for so long for so many people. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Zapier. Zapier, what does it do? Zapier is this really cool online program that lets online apps communicate with one another and it lets you automate tasks. The average Zapier user saves over $10,000 in recovery time every year. And that's why, believe it or not, there are 1.8 million people and businesses that use Zapier to streamline their work. Really, if there's anything online that you get sick of having to do over and over and over again, and you think, boy, if there's the only way to automate this and not have to go through this process, Zapier will have your back. You guys know that I have worked a lot with coding in the past, and my personal favorite type of coding project is one where I don't actually need to write any code. And Zapier allows you to do that. There's no coding involved. Uh, either of you can just jump right in and uh, start automating tasks on your end with no prior knowledge required. Wait, even me? Even you, Adam. Oh my gosh. See for yourself why teams at Airtable, Dropbox, HubSpot, Zendesk, and thousands of other companies use Zapier every day to automate their business. Try Zapier today at uh, zapier.com, Z-A-P-I-E-R.com backslash WTH. Is that free? Did I see free? It is free. 
That's Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com backslash W-T-H. Blanca Martinez, like many other Californians, has a big problem with EDD. I was going to do my last certification, but come Monday morning, found out that my account had, was pending. She called EDD right away. Even though she had been collecting benefits for much of the pandemic, she was at first told she'd need to recertify her identity. She did so right away. But after further back and forth with EDD, the woman on the other end told her it was more complicated. She did mention uh, the words to me that it's not only proving my identity, my identity, that there was fraudulent activity. Blanca says she was told by EDD not to call back because... The people that verify my identity is a whole different department and they do not take calls and they do not get messages and they have 10 to 12 weeks to verify my identity. And we reached out to EDD who said that they're inundated right now and the soonest they'll be able to provide new details is this coming Thursday. was going online, checking, you know, my balance and everything, confirming what I had from that I had received my benefits for that week. And I noticed that there was a charge for American Eagle for $400. And I thought, hmm, I haven't shopped at American Eagle. I have not been shopping with my pandemic money. So that's very interesting. So I go and I look at the transaction and see that someone from Kansas had shopped and sent themselves some online um some online clothes so uh how and, much uh, it was over between 300 and 400 oh wow okay. that they spent in at american eagle i saw the transaction um so from there i called bank of america to see what i could do they told me that because it was pending that they couldn't do anything so they had me wait until the transaction went fully through. And how long did that take? I believe it took a couple of days, um, nothing too severe. But then when I called back, once it had posted, um, they tried to tell me that I shouldn't have let it be posted. Hmm. And that there <laughs> wouldn't, um, you know, that it would be difficult now to get the money to prove. I said, well, I'm not in Kansas. So I don't have right. anything sense. Well, no, bank, banks, banks have been very difficult during these process. Banks are difficult in general, yes. you know, especially when it involves debit cards. But Adam, I'm curious. They wanted her to hold, and then they they wanted they said, "Well, we can't cancel it because it hasn't posted yet." And then when it did post, they said, "Oh, sorry, you shouldn't have let it post." Yes. That that <laughs> that to me just sounds like. Uh, a horror show. So well, what did- it's like, and what am I supposed to do? Just yeah, stop literally. posting it? I've already nothing. called you and said <laughs> there's something wrong in River City, and it's you like, have you know. nothing. To, you have no choice between those two choices because you have to do one or the other, and they've told you not to do either. But so, what did end up happening? Did you get your money back, or did you? And how long did it take? I did end up getting my money back. I had to, uh, you know, lots of phone calls, emails, proof that I was in California, and. Um, I think it, I believe it took around two weeks to a month to get back. Um, they, you know, they, they have hundreds of fraud cases every single day. So I just feel like it was all always delayed and just took way too long. So, <laughs> yeah. No but this was a, this was a bank issue. This wasn't an EDD. Issue. Yeah, I believe. So I believe they must have somehow you know, some sort of site I went on online, maybe got the card information, you know, something I had purchased online. I'm honestly not sure how they, someone in Kansas got my EDD Bank of America card information. So, right, so that was, that was on episode number one, but then there was episode number two, which as I understand was even more scary. had made a trip down to Palm Springs and used my card at a gas station. I didn't think anything of it, but after the trip to Palm Springs, came back, did my weekly benefits. I believe I had two weeks on there, um, you know, that they had owed. So I was set to get a decent, you know, um, a larger chunk of that. So I 
went online to double check. I had certified for my benefits. I went to check my account and I saw that I had received my benefits and then it said negative $2,000. So all of my EDD. Negative $2,000. So it went, yeah, it went, it had taken that amount out. Okay, you weren't upside mm -hmm. down by two thousand. Okay, right. you didn't owe the state two grand. <laughs> yes, no, it didn't go negative, but they, yeah, they took all of the money in my account. It was cleaned out as if they were watching and waiting for the balance to go up, and then just took it. Um, so it, um, yeah, out of nowhere, all my EDD money was gone, and I had rent to pay. I believe it was right at the end of the month, so I was having to pay it very quickly. You mentioned a gas station. I'm just wondering if that's where you think that the uh, card was compromised. Yes, I do think it was compromised. I was able to deduct that, you know, I was, I mostly used my card. I mean, it was for rent, gas, and, you know, the very basic necessity. So I wasn't, you know, I didn't use it too often. And so I was able to deduct from the fact that the last place I had used it was that gas station in Palm Springs. So I called the gas station and, you know, said, hey, I've had money stolen. Like, I, you know, it's something going on. And the person at the gas station said that I guess he had received multiple calls that people were, or, you know, like that wasn't the first call he had received from people asking, you know, where his money went. He didn't know what happened. Um, so I personally, I don't know if it was store employee who had put it on, but it turns out that I guess it was something called a skimmer. Yep. Yep. Skimmers. Yeah. And yep. that was my first introduction to skimmers. I didn't know they existed. Um, well, welcome to our world. <laughs> well, Adam, I actually think, Abby, it may have been your second introduction, introduction to skimmers because it sounds like the Kansas purchase on American Eagle probably also occurred really? some kind of skimming. Probably. I mean, uh, you're using a device, a uh, magnetic strip, which is super easy to record on mm -hmm. almost every skimming uh, tool out there. So, you know, what I was wondering, Adam, was if the, the Kansas uh, purchase was a, you know, a little test. test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Could have been. Could have been, because, you know, stuff was shipped to Kansas, which means you don't really know where where all of this started. Yeah. But it's very yeah. clear. It's like step one was, let's see if we get away with merchandise. And then step two is... Money. Now, let's go all the way. Let's get the full Monty on this. And, and, and the fact that they were, it seemed as though they were watching and waiting for the money to drop, it, you know, is is a little off because they they know exactly when the money's going to drop same way you do that, that that anyone going after this money is aware of when the government you know is going to put that money in your bank account in your in your debit card account and and so the question becomes um what kind of pawn scum does that yeah that that was definitely a real shocker for me, you know, like I, I of course know that people get scammed a lot, but I was, I mean, just shocked to think that there's people out there who would, who would take from people in such need, you know, in such a, a hard time for the whole entire world. And, you know, I shudder to think of people, you know, like I am so blessed to have support from my family, from my friends and people who helped me through that situation. But thinking of people who don't have that kind of support, who have kids that they have to, you know, they're, they have to feed, they've got rent, they've got bills. They don't have people who can help them and support them through something like that. You know, it's just, it ruins so many lives. I only imagine. So now you find out your 2000 is gone. Now what, how'd you feel? What'd you do? Um, devastated. Uh, definitely how'd had you, a little bit of a, how'd of a you meltdown. Feel? Wait, there's Adam. Adam. <laughs> you well, know, how'd you feel? Um, what'd you do? <laughs> it was hands down, you know, the most stressful time I think, you know, in my adult life, I, you know, I had a, a, career, a steady career of lashing, you know, the pandemic hits it's everything changes. My whole adult life has changed overnight, you know, essentially um, the workplace, every, everything has changed. And then you're relying solely on the government to like get you through it. And I've never been in a position like that. So vulnerable, so like dependent on, on a system's help. And then to have that system just 
totally backfire and, you know, make your living situation near impossible. It was so frustrating and disheartening. And, you know, I spent hours and days on, on end on the phone, just crying and, you know, just having so at my wits end with this. So, you know, just with no response, no, you know, government didn't care. It was, it was a mess. <laughs> Yeah, I believe it was after that first month going into the second that they, you know, I was finally receiving the paperwork that I had to, you know, put in for the fraud. And, and, you know, they they started doing the more communicative um, gestures with me. But, you know, it was weeks and weeks of absolutely nothing. Uh, Calling, getting hung up on, couldn't even reach any sort of system, no response to my emails. Um, And all I could do was look on Twitter and see what everybody else was saying. And it was the same thing. Nobody was answering in California. Nobody. Did your weekly payments continue to come in? I mean, this 2000 was gone. But Um, did they continue to come in? I don't believe so. I think that around that time when it happened was when there were tons of cases of fraud. And from what I remember, it seemed like they kind of shut down paying people because there were so many cases of fraud. Like I have, it went weeks and weeks and weeks without being paid. And I wasn't able to get the money in for my claims because I don't know, I can't, I can't really remember. I feel like it may have been because there was a fraudulent case happening. And so they were not continuing to payments, but so they halted. And so just to be clear for listeners, you had to apply and recertify every week that you had looked for a job, didn't find a job and therefore needed assistance. Yes. And then when you did that, um, you would get paid every week. So when you say it had taken weeks for you to get any money, that was really four or five payment periods that you Mm -hmm. didn't get paid on. Yes. And, you know, like, like I mentioned before, you know, I was fortunate enough. I had my family support and they helped me through that time, but you know, there was rent and bills due that I wasn't able to pay because they weren't answering. They weren't getting back and did nothing to help my situation for. Yeah. Cause it's not like the bills stop exactly when the, when the compensation stops. Mm-hmm. So was bank of America more helpful the second time around, or did you just have the same experience again with them? I'd say it was about the same. They, you know, like Bank of America and the California EBD, just it was almost like it was a team effort to not answer anybody's questions or concerns. So. Well, one of the ironies there, too, is that if you're on unemployment and you're trying to find a new job and then you're having, having to spend that much time on the phone or trying to get in contact with the unemployment office or Bank of America, that kind of cuts into the uh, job application process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I spent, it felt like it was a full-time job trying to get the money that was stolen back from me and, you know, settle. You're trying to do a full-time job and you're doing a (laughs) full-time job trying to get your money back. Yes. Yeah. How did it ultimately resolve itself? Did, Did you get the money back and how long did it ultimately take you to get the money back? I did get the money back. I believe it was around that two month mark. Um, And it took, you know, I had a case, um, a caseworker. I had to um, fill out a lot of paperwork, do a lot of that sort of thing. Um, It kind of went away from being digital and more into, you know, a paper trail with that sort of thing. So we started, um, I had like all this um, fraud paperwork I had to fill out. Um, and apply for and then through the mail it obviously takes a little bit longer so it definitely you know it took I think closer to that two month mark to actually see things go back to normal in terms of benefits and everything and during and during that two month mark in addition to this money being gone you did not see any additional money from California no I was I was full lap broke for well over a month Um, you know, I'd have to check my actual statements, but I believe it was between that first and second month that I did start to see a return of benefits. So it started slowly, but it was, you know, they went a long time without answering or responding to anything. And there was definitely a period of limbo where. No, and it's not easy for you to catch up. That's clear. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely.
According to comparecards.com, 23% of Americans have been the victim of skimming at the gas pump. That is up 8% from last year. Was there anything that you got out of the experience that if you were to say, okay, if I had to go through this process again, I would do this differently? Or was it just pretty much a, you know, complete another cluster? I would say it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, you know, I feel like I learned a lot. Like I had mentioned, I didn't even know what a skimmer was uh, before this happened. Growing up in small town Montana, I mean, these kind of frauds are not really common. Um, I didn't even know that that existed. Uh, Most people so, think a skimmer is something you use to clean the top of a swimming pool. So, <laughs> yep, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, but yeah, no. So I, you know, I learned about, I learned that, and learned. Um, you know, I feel like a lot more um, emphasis on me uh, needing to continually check your accounts, make sure that everything is correct, you know, like be on it if, if there's a charge that you aren't familiar with, you know, making sure to always be checking. That's something that um, was a big thing, big lesson for me. I think over a hundred billion dollars worth of unemployment compensation, in fact, much more than that, disappeared during COVID and that a lot of states are in the process of still clawing that money back along with the federal government. Now, is that PPP money as well you're talking about, or are you talking about unemployment? Uh, uh, unemployment benefits, as well as, did, I believe the federal government was also providing uh, extended unemployment benefits. Yeah, for, yeah they were. Yeah. And so it was, I mean, the state of Washington alone had hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fraud uh, that they were able to recover, I think, half of it back. But scammers got on this really quickly, and they went to town. And an awful lot of people got hurt. And so I, you know, I hear how grateful you are in terms of the fact that your family stood up for you. But this could clearly devastate somebody who didn't have the kind of support system that you had. And it makes you think that the scammers should have like the penalties for these guys should be merciless, if you ask me, because they are completely merciless when it comes to the people they are affecting. And that was something that was so frustrating for me. Honestly, I, you know, I didn't know that there were people this low and that there were, you know, people who would do this. And I, I wanted, you know, justice. I was like, how, how can people do this? People like, you know, it seemed that they were telling me, well, there's nothing you can do. They took the money, like the impossible to track and all that. And it's like, how this is the internet. Like you, there need to be consequences for this. There that's they should absolutely be punished to the highest extent <laughs> they become very aggressive in terms of going after those people that i identify but there were a lot of people that they couldn't identify and a lot of people that were operating way beyond the jurisdiction in the united states in countries that look the other way uh either because it was generating a line item for the 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 gdp of a particular country uh or it was uh that the government just didn't care. And even if they're able to track them down too, the damage has already been done if uh, you're one of the people that's been stolen from. We truly appreciate uh, you sharing your story with us and our listeners today. And we can't thank you enough for taking time and, and being with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to share my story in hopes that people can learn from it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, guys, skimmers. Swimming pools. You said that. And I'm like, you know, every, I don't know if people who haven't spent a lot of time in swimming pools think swimming pool first with skimmer. But I don't know what else you would think of. What else is, I mean, skimmer. Mob, gambling. Oh, yeah. That's skimming right. money off top. <laughs> <laughs> you really are from New Jersey, aren't you? <laughs> I am. You know, it's, it's where, that's where, it's, the slogan in New Jersey is, Skimming ain't just about pools, baby. <laughs> As I recall, like, you know, 
back in the day when skimmers were first an issue, maybe 10 years ago, I think that was about when I first started hearing about them, they were pretty big. And if you were paying attention, you actually would have had to have been a little daft to fall for it. Because you could see, they're like, oh, there's something on my something that I'm skimming my card in. Are they still pretty easy to recognize? Or uh, my understanding is they're not. No, they're not. They're really low profile. From when we had uh, Brian on a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that Brian Ebert, one of the things that he said was that unless you're specifically looking for it, you would never notice it. Um, they're small. They fit right over the card slot, especially in a gas pump. And yeah, you would be none the wiser. Especially at a gas pump, you're kind of distracted. Right. But I, I, I heard Brian talking about that, but I still feel like I would see it. I feel like you would see some sort of little nubbin sticking, you know, a little bit of the profile would be a slightly wrong, and you'd clock it. Are, are you saying that there's something that fits inside of the card uh, r- slot that is so small that y- you wouldn't be able to detect it? I, I just don't buy it. They fit over it, so that's the thing. That it's not that you're seeing something that's uh, in the card slot; it covers the card slot. But it looks just like the card slot, right? Exactly. So it's like a, it's like the the fake uh, website landing page that you get from a phishing email, right? You also have to think about the context. You know, when you go and use an ATM machine, you're kind of really focused because you've got to come up with a variety of different things in order to do it right. You know, how much you're going to do is you're thinking about money at a gas pump. Well, now you're thinking about money, but at a gas pump, you're in the middle of a trip. You may have to run to the restroom. So you just want to get it in, get the pump going and then leave your car and go into the gas station or you want to get food or you're thirsty, whatever. So you're thinking about five or six different things. Just it's a different environment than when you're at the ATM machine. And Adam, so I'm so happy to hear that I know that's how you operate. I'm going to have to put someone on you next time. If you, you leave your car alone at the gas station and go in and do stuff? No, I don't. I don't. But it's a lot of other people that do. I watch them do it. Oh, uh, I gotcha. All right. Well, that's a drag because I like your car. Just like my watch that you've been trying to steal for seven years. Yeah, for listeners who don't know, whenever Adam is relaxing and thinking, I like Bo, I put my hand on his wrist to say I like him too and then I try to take his watch (laughs) well I I just the only other thing I learned in this episode is that you know the bad the bad people out there the threat actors uh, are incapable of um, any kind of moral empathy yeah Mm -hmm. there's no there's no feeling heart there this is just uh, I don't get it I get it, but I don't get it. Bo, I, I, I appreciate the way you feel about this. Yes. And heaven knows you are a thousand percent right. But think about all yeah. of the people that do ransomware attacks oh. against healthcare facilities and then talk to me about the moral compass of those engaged in these nefarious activities. There is no moral compass. So you're basically saying that <laughs> compared to the ransomware people... These these unemployment benefits uh, thieves are, are kind of, you know, they're the choir boys. I would just say that they, they, they all, all suck. They they're all, all suck. looking for moral compass somewhere or they don't care. It's yeah. right. Look, it's all about the money. It's about the money and everything else is collateral damage. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, one of the other things, too, is that the covid epidemic hit so quickly so if you just imagine the amount of upheaval that you'd have been going through for COVID and then unemployment and then getting ripped off um, all in rapid succession, that just sounds extremely stressful. There are insufficient protections available in the system. And someone asked an interesting question the other day. What was is it? Is it easier to spot a skimmer or spot a transaction? And the answer is it is not as easy to spot a skimmer as it used to be, but it is easy to spot a transaction. You just have to look to see if a transaction occurred because you'll know whether or not you did it. And you can shut it down immediately when you see that, but it is, it is actually a muscle that you need to exercise. So if you have benefits coming in in the future, they may go to a debit card, but usually there's, a, there's the ability to transfer them, isn't there, Travis? Yeah, it's definitely possible and it's really easy to do just to transfer from one account into another, Um, especially if you know for a fact that it's not very well secured. 
like these cards were. All right, so that seems like a seems like a lock, Adam. You're fired. Okay. All right, so when you get your benefits, I want you to make sure that you transfer them to your savings account, okay? No, you don't. You basically want me to transfer my benefits to you. No, no, no. I'm going to take care of that. I'm just trying to, like, cover my ass. I'm sure you are. <laughs> All right, that's that. It's uh, been a fun time exploring the criminality of absolute pond scum with you i hope you have a wonderful week thanks everyone for listening and uh if you like the episode please give us five stars and leave us a, a review on apple podcasts ratings ratings <laughs> <laughs> what the heck with adam levin is a production of loud tree media it's produced by andrew stephen the man with two first names you can find us online at loudtreemedia.com and on instagram twitter and facebook at adam k levin 